I am just going to do a little bit of maintenance from the committee side. Just as a reminder to all our members that the council elections are currently open at the moment and we would um, recommend everybody to use their vote. Um, you should have gotten an email maybe in the last week or two, so just a reminder to do that. And also um, from our own side, from the Midwest Society, we are looking for committee members to join us this year at the AGM in May. So if anybody is interested, please get in contact with any of us. Um, we'd be more than happy to have people join the committee this year. So with that, I'll hand it over to Brian. We will take Q&A at the end um, if you want to drop anything into the Q&A box and we'll field them to both Brian and Damien. Great. Listen, thank you, Jennifer. Th thanks a million. And thanks to the Association and um, Society for the Midwest Society for inviting us to participate and LIA are delighted to participate and honoured to have the opportunity to speak to you all um, and we're, we're happy to sponsor this event and bring along with us one of our um, very experienced and knowledgeable members in Damien Wallace who will talk you through the CPD event. Um, a little bit about ourselves, LIA, if you do or not know about us, I'll introduce. We are the Centre of Excellence in relation to education and development of finance professionals and we offer QQI accredited courses at level seven and level nine but our primary um, delivery of courses meet with minimum competence requirements in relation to financial planning and the finance industry. What I'll do is I'll talk a little bit at the end if we have time, just in relation to what LIA offer, but I really will let Damien get into uh, everything. And I'll introduce Damien as, like myself, we're both CFP professionals, so hopefully we will be able to answer as many questions at the end uh, together, but Damien's content is very informative and I'll leave him to do most of the talking. And I'll talk to you at the end. Thanks a million. Uh, thanks a million, Brian, and um, I'm very pleased to be here today and to have the opportunity of uh, joining you and the members for a presentation around financial planning, which includes pensions, but is, is somewhat broader than that as well. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen and we will then um, kick off. Um, so what we're doing really is an overview of the CFP process and what the CFP process is all about is um, it's about planning, it's about financial planning and it's about, I want to talk about how it can benefit accountants as well and in terms of interaction between CFP professionals and accountants and I'm going to, you know, show you some case studies where I've worked very, very closely um, with some accountants for their clients to benefit them in the long run. And the outcomes have been very good in, in most of these cases. Um, and what, what financial planning is, is it's a process of developing strategies to help people manage their financial affairs to meet life goals. Um, and fundamentally, we complement each other in that regard. I mean, as accountants, you give advice on finance, on planning, we give a different type of advice, but when we're combining the benefits of both of our skills, ultimately um, the client benefits from significantly enhanced um, advice and it ensures that, you know, that they get the best possible guidance in terms of the opportunities that are there for them. The CFP is an internationally recognized qualification. It's a process driven approach and it's an advice based approach. And the process involves, in the first instance, the collection of the data, the raw material that allows us to start our journey with the client. Um, very often, much of this will be provided by uh, the accountant in the first instance. And then if we feel we can be of benefit to the client, um, it will involve a meeting with the client as well to follow up a meeting very often with the client and the accountant to follow up, seek further information. And we then go away and we analyze the client's needs and based on the information we've been given and based on the guidance from the accountant professional in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And we develop recommendations then in terms of where we see uh, the opportunities for, for that client to benefit from our guidance and our advice. Um, if it's agreed, um, we go ahead and implement the plan and then the ongoing review is very, very important. So whether that's in the context of pension planning or investment advice, whether it's in terms of business planning or corporate investments, um, 
the most important thing we do is a regular review. As an accountant, you'll do the accounts every year. For us as a financial planner, we review the performance of the, the plan and tweak it and make whatever changes might be needed as we go forward. Because there are always circumstances changing in, in, a, in a client's situation, their business and their life. And it's important that as we go forward, um, that it's not just transactional, that it's not just about dealing with it at the start. It's about following up and ensuring that we continue to monitor and advise and adapt as we go forward. And um, it's a collaboration between the accountant, the client, and us as the financial planner. Um, and it provides holistic, a holistic overview of their needs, not just the transactional um, issue that might be identified at the outset. So as I see it just briefly, and uh, Brian will develop this a little bit further, there are opportunities for accountants here and for accountants firms here. Um, and many of the most successful uh, CFPs that we have actually are, are, are were um, accountants. So there's an opportunity for an accountancy firm to train a CFP um, and employ them. There's an opportunity to employ a fully qualified CFP to work with you uh, as part of your practice. And there's also the opportunity, which is what most accountants that I deal with are doing, is um, to link up with a CFP firm so that we benefit from the expertise of both organizations. Um, but either one of these can only enhance your, your offering for your client, regardless of which opportunity or option you decide to take. So what I propose to do is look at some case studies in relation to, in the first instance, pension planning, some business protection cases, corporate investment, just a brief overview of mortgages, inheritance tax planning, and some cash flow modeling to show you how ultimately for the high net worth clients, how we, how we can make a difference to their life in the long term. Um, each of these are cases that I've worked on with accountants, so they're relevant, they're recent, and um, they, they're all uh, have gone through the process and have stood up to scrutiny. So the first person I want to talk about is a pharmacist that we recently looked after, and the pharmacist had never properly funded her pension. Um, her original intention had been to retire at 65, but now she's looking to exit the business at age 60. Um, she has 30 years service in the company, and there are significant funds built up in the company already. She's looking at selling the business. Um, and the question is, how can she extract the funds that are built up in a tax efficient manner? The key information that we needed was in the first instance to establish what her salary has been over the last number of years. Um, and the salary was 120,000 a year. Um, she has a current pension fund of 425,000 euro um, and no other pension benefits. Um, her normal retirement age under the current plan, as I said, is 65, but she does want to retire at 60. So the first thing we needed to do then was to assess her options based on the current position. And the starting point for that is to do what's called a revenue maximum funding calculation because that will indicate what the maximum allowable uh, fund she can provide. And in her case, it was a, a number in excess of 3 million. Um, so the company is actually allowed fund, her company is actually allowed fund, a fund in excess of 3 million to provide maximum benefits for her. However, as you'll be aware, the personal fund threshold is 2 million, so there's no point um, going beyond that figure. But the magic number is 2.15 million. And I'll explain that to you in a second because of tax uh, credits in relation to the 150,000. So the plan in relation to this lady was to um, fund for 2.15 million, which meant we were taking the, um, taking the 4.125 and boosting it by a single payment from the company of 1.725 million. Um, we amended the retirement age of the plan to age 60. So she now has a fund of 2.15 with a retirement age of 60. And that was a transfer directly from the company into her pension plan in a tax efficient manner. 
What that then allowed her to do was in the first instance, take 25% of the 2 million personal fund threshold in the form of tax, tax free and taxable cash. So the first 200,000 uh, was tax free and the balance was taxed at 20% resulting in net cash of 440,000 euro. So that was the check paid out to her by the insurance company. Because she had paid 60,000 tax on that money, she got a credit against her excess fund charge of 150,000, which was the amount over the 2 million. And this meant that she wasn't then taxed on the 150,000. So that left a balance of 1.65 million and that's allocated to her approved retirement fund and will be drawn down as income into retirement. She will be required to take 4% a year from age 60, and that will increase uh, to 5% after 70. Um, the important thing in this respect is that the retirement reliefs, which are normally available for people selling business, uh, are not affected by this transaction. So any benefit that she needs to take from retirement relief, um, which will be done through her accountant, um, is, is, is still available and not affected in any way. So that was the first pension planning opportunity that we did recently. The second one um, was a builder. And the difference in this case was that, and this happens with a lot of people in construction actually, is that they, their pension plan tends to be property-based and they don't see the value. Um, it's a general statement, but I've come across it fairly often that, you know, builders by their nature see their opportunity to buy smaller units, do them up, either sell them on or keep them for pension purposes. So very often we find that builders are reaching retirement without having um, built up any pension fund. And in this case, the opportunity arose there to, in the first instance, set up a, a company plan, but we were going to do something different for him. We were going to fund for maximum tax-free cash using the older pension rules, which are the salary and service rules. So he had a salary of 120,000 euro, um, which he had had for a number of years, and service in the company in excess of 20 years. So that allowed him to use the uplifted rules for lump sum benefit at retirement, provided he was retiring at normal retirement age, which he was. So we set up a pension plan and made a one-off contribution of 180,000 from his company into the fund. And he was then able to mature this as a tax-free lump sum um, using the one and a half times salary rules. So he didn't have any residual pension after it. It was just purely an opportunity to once again, take money from the company in a tax efficient manner, uh, using the available pension rules to do that. This was an interesting one that I recently was asked to get involved in with with uh, an accountant client. And it was a lady who had been divorced a number of years ago. And uh, she didn't have a lot of money, but she was now coming up to the time where um, she had got the house as part of the divorce settlement, but from a cash flow point of view, wouldn't have had a whole lot of money. Um, she was coming up to the time where the pension adjustment order that had been applied to her husband's um, pension fund was now becoming available because he was reaching retirement age. So as part of the divorce settlement, she got a 50% order of her pension, her husband's future pension. Now, when we assessed, she had, she had got notification from the um, company where he worked to say that um, he was going to be drawing his pension within a month because he was coming up to 65 um, and the benefit that she would get representing 50% of that fund was 27,800 lump sum and a pension for life of 7,300, or life as she thought. Um, and this represented half of his benefit. The accountant asked me to review the options. And typically when we'd be reviewing options of this nature, there's a couple of things we'd look for. The first thing is that, does she have a transfer value? In other words, can she give up the right to the um, defined benefit scheme in order to get a value that's that, that would give her different options? 
Now, it's not always the right option, but it's always worth considering that. And the second thing we were wondering was that in the event of the, um, the death of the husband, would she retain the 7,300? Because this would technically be half of the overall pension and typically in a defined benefit pension scheme, um, the surviving spouse receives half of the pension. Um, what we were told surprised us actually and really surprised her. And the rule under the pension adjustment order was that while she was given 50% of her husband's pension, she was given no benefit on debt. So that meant that in the event of the husband's debt, uh, her pension would cease. Um, this then threw a different complexion altogether on what we would advise her to do. Um, so having reviewed the options with the trustees, there was indeed a transfer option available. And this is in keeping with a lot of the defined benefit companies. Now, the defined benefit schemes where companies are trying to sell off to the client the, the right to the future income. And they're doing this because trustees don't want the risk of um, continuing to have to pay pensions into the future any longer. But in this lady's case, um, the trade-off figure was 197,000 euro. So they were offering her um, 197,000 euro in lieu of taking the 27,000 plus the 7,300 a year. Now, why this made sense for her was twofold. First of all, if she transferred that into a retirement bond in her own name, um, she was able to avail of different retirement options then and use the 25% tax-free cash option um, and then invest the balance in an ARF plan um, as opposed to having to take an annuity. And the most important thing was that there was no further link with her husband. And in the event of his death, her benefits were not going to be affected. And she would also then, in the event of her death, have the residual asset value in her ARF, which could be passed on to her daughter. Um, so what she did was she transferred the fund to the retirement bond. Uh, once it was in there, she then matured it and took out 49,000 uh, in tax-free cash and the balance of just under 150,000 went into her, um, her ARF plan. And even looking at that, it's, it's, it gave her what she needed to give her cash now when she needs it. But it also basically, if you did the multiple of what they were offering, they were giving approximately, when you take out the 27,000 tax free cash, the 180,000 represented about 25 years of pension payment. So in many respects, it was, it was absolutely the right decision for her. Um, and for most people in that scenario, it would be. So that leads me on to the other big area in terms of pensions now, and I've touched on it briefly in the context of the lady that uh, was divorced, and that is transfer values from defined benefit schemes. And as I said, it's becoming more and more of a factor nowadays because um, trustees want to divest their responsibility um, from pension schemes. They do not want to be committed to um, long-term income payments to people who are probably going to live longer into the future um, and it's they're offering very significant multiples in terms of ranges from you know 25 to 32 times i've even seen recently for somebody in order to move their pension fund across no it's not for everybody and we need to be very careful in giving advice in this area and certainly we we give the overview and give the benefits, but ultimately in this area, the client needs to make their mind up themselves because once they make the decision to transfer the value from the scheme, there's no going back. They can't go back and say, I'll give you back the money and I'd like you to give me the income stream for future. Um, and it does involve an element of risk because the risk then moves from the, um, trustee to manage the money into the future and to provide for the investment directly to the client um, who will then need to invest their money and secure a return that will provide them with the level of income that they need in the future. But for most people, the prospect of getting 
you know, 25 or 30 times their pension up front and the ability to be able to pass that on to their um, spouse and subsequently to their kids, less than 30% tax um, is a huge, huge benefit. Um, and it, as I said, it's becoming more and more prevalent and people are seeking more and more information on it. And for you as accountants, I'm certain that you have clients out there who are going to be knocking on your door to ask for advice on what should they do, because we are seeing a frequency now of uh, transactions in that area and a frequency of people actually um, being offered transfer values from their pension schemes. It also opens up a wider range of opportunities around drawdown in terms of they can take the 25% cash and can draw down um, a higher amount of money in the early years when we found in terms of our analysis and our advice to clients that um, people are more likely to need money between 65 and 75 than they are post 75. And for a lot of people, the old defined benefit scheme was the wrong way around because as they got older with, with indexation and that their, their pension fee, uh, payment from the scheme increased. Whereas in reality, a lot of people immediately after retirement are more likely to need money. So the flexibility of an ARF um, is better for them because they can access more money at an earlier stage with the caveat, obviously, that there is a risk that they'll run out of it if they use too much up early on. And interestingly, in recent times, we're seeing a lot of UK transfer requests as well. Um, for the very same reason, people have moved back from working in the UK, people with historic funds are now concerned about Brexit. And also the companies in the UK are applying the same standards as Irish trustees and wanting to get out of defined benefit schemes. And as a result of providing enhanced opportunities and enhanced transfer values for people to move. Just to be aware that in the case of the UK, uh, in order to be allowed uh, transfer from a UK fund to an Irish fund, there are a couple of different layers and a couple of additional layers. And the first one is that um, HMS revenue require a benefit statement prepared by a UK financial advisor uh, and the client wishing to transfer is required to obtain one of those in advance. And that is a benefit analysis statement which compares the value of the UK transfer versus the the, the or sorry the UK benefit versus the potential transfer. Um, they cost four or five thousand euros to prepare. Um, and it's difficult to get an, a UK advisor now to sign up to providing these because the the professional indemnity risk of giving advice in this area is, is quite significant. Um, the second thing that's required is um, it must go into a specific uh, fund called a cure ops fund. So there are specific funds available that are pre-approved again by HM Revenue for um, transfers of this nature. So they're difficult, they're time consuming, but they're not impossible. And they are becoming more prevalent now with more and more people concerned about changes in rules, changes in potential laws in the UK in terms of transfers into the future. So I think you will be seeing more of these requests coming across your desk and more requests for um, advice in that area. Um, so that's that's a quick overview on the pension related areas. Um, we're going to move on now to um, just inheritance tax planning, which is equally important for you as accountants, because it's a huge area and it's one that very often isn't properly um, addressed because, you know, people don't very often grasp what they can do uh, to save the tax in the future. And I, I, it's a unique type of client will see the benefit of this because essentially what you're doing is you're using capital now to save tax later. In other words, you're, you're being asked to spend money now to save tax that will become due when you're dead. And for a lot of people, that's just not gonna, gonna fly. But for those that do, it's a very efficient way of, of funding for the tax because the first thing is that the premium will never exceed the payout. So, um, and I'll show you an example in a second. And 
the, as I said, the particular client mind, there's a particular client mindset needed to see the benefit of it. Um, so just briefly in terms of an analysis of one I did recently, a married couple aged 64 and 62, and they have assets of 6 million. Um, and they came looking to know what the cost would be to uh, A, plan for their inheritance, and B, how should they structure an arrangement to facilitate a tax efficient approach. Um, so obviously they're using the 3% per annum gift allowance from now on to reduce um, whatever is available and that will go to the children and any grandchildren that might be there in the future. Um, they have three, three children and the plan is to leave the estate equally to the children. So based on the 6 million, when we take off what the likely um, uh, thresholds will be, th there's likely to be tax in the region of 1.5 million um, on that estate. And when you, when you, you know, suggest to somebody that that's likely to be their tax, it's, it, it's staggering really. Um, now the solution is, is, is very often difficult to in an unpalatable way from a financial point of view, because the cost on a year by year basis can be quite expensive. So in this case, to provide for um, a premium to cover the 1.5 million tax, it's 38,600 per annum. But even over 25 years, that totals 965,000 um, euro. And that's only still two thirds of what the payout will be. So the point I made earlier about the mindset and the need to assess and accept that it will never um, reach what you pay in, in terms of the payout will always exceed that. And it's really using capital now to reduce uh, tax in the future. But it's for a particular type of client. It's a very valuable type of policy if you get it in place. And um, it's being used a lot now by high network people that we advise. Just a brief overview in terms of business protection. Um, and again, it's an area that's not very often um, tackled um, by, by, by the financial sector generally, and I mean the financial planners and by, um, by accountants as well, because there's a bit of mystique about it and about a difficulty in trying to set up how an understanding of how it should be set up. But in reality, it's, it's quite simple, and I'll take you briefly through it. I mean, for business protection, there are two or three types of arrangements. The first one is a key person arrangement, and that's very, very simple, where an employer or an owner of a business will employ a sudden a key person in the event of sudden death of that key person. Um, and what that means is that that key person, if there's a financial loss accruing to the company or to the individual as a result of that key person uh, dying, then um, a policy can be put in place in a tax efficient manner to, to cover that. Um, the second one then is the partnership or co-directors insurance. I mean, most small businesses are either a partnership or a co-directorship. And under the partnership arrangement, the partner, each of the partners can either insure themselves or a three-way type arrangement or four-way type arrangement can be done. Um, under the co-directors arrangement, again, each director can insure each other or the, the, the company can come up with a structure where the company would um, employ the directors but the key aspect that backs into this arrangement is what's called a buy and sell arrangement because the life cover is, is of no value if there's not a, a structure around it to ensure that on death, there's a binding agreement to buy and sell the deceased share on debt. And typically what happens is that each of the partners enter into um, an arrangement with um, the other partners, whether that's directors or partners, um, and the surviving partners are then bound to buy the share of the deceased partner. But equally, the deceased partners are bound to sell their share. The, the, the next of kin of the deceased partners are bound to sell. So it means you can't be left in a situation where um, on death, a spouse or a relative of the spouse comes in to take up their share of the business and turmoil ensues. And we've seen that so often. Um, so these structures, when they're properly set up and put in place appropriately, uh, add huge value from a safety valve point of view to the individuals, but also to the entity.
because it protects it against um, turmoil occurring in the event of the death, unexpected death of one of the partners or the directors. Um, the other area that has become very, very important for companies in recent times, particularly those that are building cash reserves, is the whole area of corporate investments. Um, and the background to these is that companies have been building up surplus funds in the company. Um, now, with negative interest rates, they're seeing that banks are charging uh, up to 0.65 per annum for just having the funds on deposit. Um, there is the whole issue about the closed company surcharge for undistributed income. Um, and the insurance companies have come up with what they call corporate investment plans, which facilitate investment either on a monthly or a once-off basis uh, to an investment fund that it sits on the company balance sheet, but is not a deposit account. So therefore, it, um, it fits the criteria to avoid that undistributed income charge. Um, it's an alternative to deposits in a negative interest rate environment. And also, it gives an opportunity for companies to, to take an investment risk as well if they want to um, do something that has the potential to provide a return that will be better than deposit type return. Now, risk by its nature uh, brings risk and, you know, you, you have to factor in the downside as well. But I found I've been doing these funds with companies for 20, 25 years. Those that keep them and maintain them for the long term have invariably done very, very well, regardless of the risk approach that they take, because over time, um, you know, markets tend to smooth out return and time in the market tends to be a great risk minimization measure. Um, so this is a big growth area for us as well in recent times, particularly in our in, in our advice to um, accountants. And we're even finding that charities now who historically would have been very conservative are being forced to look at this type of thing in order to ensure that they meet um, any some kind of a reasonable return on their money and not just see it eroding over time with negative interest rates and uh, inflation. I just want to briefly, I mean, mention about in terms of mortgages and how how we've assisted clients with with mortgages. I mean, this is pretty basic. You'll be very much aware of this, but um, surprisingly enough, a lot of clients when they get the a mortgage, they never go back and review it. And at the moment, now you know, with interest rates, particularly from some of the new entrants into the market. Um, at very, very low fixed rates, um, it is possible to make significant savings. So, you know, someone, the difference in repayments over a 20 year term on a 250,000 mortgage for someone um, at a rate of 1.95 versus 3%, you can see there is around 30,000 euro um, between the, the amount paid over the term and the total interest paid over the term. Um, where we see this for the switcher, where this becomes important is that people are used to paying a set amount and where it works very well for people is if they wish to move their interest rate to a new rate with a new lender, but maintain their current repayment rate, they can reduce the term significantly. So on your 25 year rate at three and a half percent versus a two and a half percent rate, um, you know, you can reduce the mortgage to 21 years and six months by paying the 3.5 rate uh, charge. Um, and little, little, you know, initiatives like that, that we've taken with clients um, tend to work and add value um, over the term, you know. So just in terms of the overall pulling the whole thing together, in terms of us as financial planners, what we do, we answer the what ifs for people. And the question that I'm most asked, um, more than any other question, is will I have enough? When I sit down with clients, the question they want answered is will I have enough? And what they mean by that is, will I have enough if I die too soon? Will there be enough there for my family um, to provide for their financial needs into the future? If I live too long, will I have enough in my pension? will it continue to provide an income for me into the future? Um, or if I get sick along the way, will I have enough? And that can be protected with income protection plans and serious illness cover. And we pull all of that together into a process, a 
a cash flow modeling process. So this is just an example of what we would do. And we'd input huge amounts of information based on the client's circumstances, based on their circumstances now, and based on their potential um, interests into the future in terms of what they might want to spend money on, based on their need, their projected need into the future, and based on what we know from a standing point of where they're coming from now, in terms of what they feel they may need um, and how they can fill that gap and fill that need. So this is an example of one of those cash flow modeling reports that we'd produce. And the one thing you see here is that there's red on the plan. And what that means is that there's a shortfall. So just with this lady, when we were, when we were assessing her plan, what she wanted to do was um, retire at age 60 but the problem she had was that her pension wasn't kicking in until age um, 65. And you'll see the tall blue line at 65, which shows the input of the tax-free cash at that time. So the first thing we identified was um, that you'll see from her retiring at 60, she had enough cash for 60 and 61 to keep going. But then for the three years up to 65, she didn't have enough at all. Once her pension kicked in then, um, she was fine up to age 79 or 80 when um, she then started to run out of money relative to what she felt her need was. So the job for us to do in that case was then to say, right, what can we do here to A, fill the gap to allow you to meet your need at age 60, B, um, cut down your lifestyle costs to ensure that you either save more now to provide for more in the future, or change your parameters in terms of um, what you might feel is appropriate for you into the future. So ultimately what this lady did was she decided A, she'd reduce her spending by uh, 10,000 a year now. She'd start putting that into an ABC pot, which would build up sufficient funds between now and age uh, 61 to allow her retire at 60, cover the interest, cover the income need between 61 and 65. And then in turn, um, it was also going to eat into the red at the end of the period. Um, and that's what it's about. It's about identifying the opportunities. It's about looking at the, the problems and solving those problems in creative ways that use all available tools, whether it is uh, tax related, whether it is pension related, savings, investment, Sometimes the solution is that a person who's very conservative needs to take a slightly higher um, approach to their um, a slightly higher approach to their risk approach in an effort to try and achieve a higher return over the longer term. For others, it's a means of a trade-off between reducing consumption now to provide for future consumption. But ultimately, our job is to assess those trade-offs, to present them in an understandable way to the clients, very often as assisted by their accountant, and then collectively make the decisions that will allow people to um, make informed decisions that best equip them to meet their aims into the future. So I hope in terms of the very quick and very brief overview that I've given here of what I as a CFP can do and assist and do on a daily basis in assisting um, my accountant colleagues um, is of benefit to you. And um, I'm happy to take any, any questions now that you might have. That is absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Damien. We no do problem. have a few questions in here. Um, let me see. So the first one here, do you have a transfer fund to the ARF at the date of divorce? Do you have to transfer fund to the ARF at the date of divorce? Or could you decide to take transfer value at a later date? Yeah, you can. OK, that depends on the scheme. First rule is if it's a defined, um, if it's a defined contribution scheme at the date of divorce, you have the right to take your transfer at that point um, because a defined contribution is effectively a pot of money. So in that scenario, um, the, the client could have taken a transfer value at that point. Um, the problem in this case was it was a defined benefit scheme. And at the time that the there wasn't a transfer value available at that point, um, at the point of the pension adjustment order, it was a future benefit that was being offered. But the trustees obviously in the run-up to retirement 
had offered the transfer value. Next one. Is it possible to mature a PRB immediately without penalty or charges? Um, it depends on how it's set up. And again, that's a very good question because um, the, the one we set up for that lady now was deliberately set up without any penalty and any charge. Um, typically, if you're setting up an average PRB, there'll be penalties of maybe three or four or five percent in year one, reducing over five years down to one percent. But that's called a, the, the type of transaction we did there is called a bed and breakfast transaction in the industry. It's known as the money is just going in and coming back out again. So in that scenario, what you would do is you charge the client a fee for your advice and there'd be no commission charges or no penalties or anything applied to um, applied to the transaction. So they, they, in that case, they, they, there was no fee. Now, there are other rules around the PRB. You must be over 50 before you can mature it. So if somebody got a pension adjustment order at 45 and transferred it into a PRB, they couldn't in any event uh, transfer it until age 50. Thank you. Um, next one we have is, with respect to taking a transfer value from a DB scheme, are you better to wait until you're older, say 55 plus, as opposed to taking a transfer value when you were 45? In general, the answer to that would be yes. Now, there are times when you might take a different view. And one of those would be, at the moment, in recent times, because interest rates were so low, it was a really good time for transfer values because um, the, the value is a function of the interest rates. Um, and generally, if interest rates start to rise, the cost of providing the benefit will be lower for the fund, so therefore the transfer value will reduce. But in general, you would argue that you should wait closer to retirement to take the value. The other reason why you mightn't, and this is particularly important for people, is depending on the number of people who are ahead of you in the queue. If the fund, you'd need to assess the fund and see is it properly funded, because if the overall pension fund is underfunded, um, there is a risk that you could, by the time you get there, um, there might be nothing there. Because what people don't understand about a defined benefit scheme is that they think it's a guarantee, but it's actually a promise to pay a benefit. And I mean, PTSB now in recent times sent out a check, recent times in the last couple of years, sent out a check to all their members who weren't already on benefits. So they wound up the scheme and there's been, you know, loads of examples of that happening. Um, so it's in general, the answer is you wait as close to retirement as, as is appropriate. But with the caveat that you assess the, the fund, you assess the type of uh, company that's backing that fund, and you make your decision on that basis then. Brian, if you want to add yeah, I might, I might join, yeah. in, join in there because uh, I might have written that question um, because that, that's exactly the scenario I would have been. I'm an ex-banker, and the banks that are leaving the country, uh, which you would know about at the moment, they would have had defined benefit schemes and they would be offering the transfer option. But staff who would be in the category of age 45, what I'd say to that individual is, what would be a consideration is perhaps an enhanced value, which is being offered at the moment. There's an enhanced transfer potential um, taken into consideration what potentially the beneficiary should be due to get at their normal retirement age. And the scheme would effectively offer a transfer value assuming a particular life expectancy age, um, which for somebody at 45 would typically be now 83, right? 83, 84. And they would basically calculate what the annuity they should get for the 20 years that they would get if they retire and offer them an enhancement now for the same value. So it is, there is a lot to consider um, in relation to that. But as Damien rightly touched on, it's also to do with the promise. It's not a guarantee. And for somebody who's 45, might consider it on the basis that you are very much down the pecking order and your typically retirement age is set at in around 62, 63 from my experience of the defined benefit schemes. Hopefully that adds a bit of value. Yeah, just by way of example, I had um, a client in one of the banks, this was a number of years ago, and uh, he, he was 51 or 52 due to get his benefit at age 60, but had been watching the transfer value and the value we assessed it on an annual basis and it was 352,000 euro and it had been that or thereabouts for two or three years and 
the following year, we went back to get the value and it was gone up to 878,000 euro. Because what had happened in the interim was that there was a huge injection into the fund. Um, and that meant that the fund now was significantly funded when it had been completely underfunded the year before. So that was a whole different conversation then. Um, so that guy moved at that time then because he didn't feel he wanted to wait and wait and wait. He was happy to do what he did and got his money out, you know. I, I know for the 45 year olds at the moment, like, for example, I, I know of the enhanced offer that's being positioned to members of DB schemes for banks that are exiting is typically a 20 times multiplier yeah. of the annuity that they would expect to get at their normal retirement age. Um, I could share with you. I'm looking at mine right in front of me. I have, yeah. I have an offer that's been offered to me and it's significant and you need to just weigh up um, a lot of factors and, and get independent advice. Okay. I think we have an add on to that then as well saying the other benefit of taking the transfer value is that if we manage it well in the R, we can leave it to children. That's, that's true. Yeah, you, you can have succession. Yeah, and I mean, over, over the recent number of years, now I did an analysis there for clients there just middle of last year. And um, bearing in mind now there had been, you know, we had a financial crash and we had the, um, we had the, um, the, the COVID thing during the year, the drop in investment values and all that. But this guy, he was actually one of the guys that had put in a significant amount before he retired. And he had put in one point, his total was 1.2 million starting off. That was the value of his fund. Now, in the period we assessed he had taken out, um, actually the financial crash wasn't part of it. It was about 10 or 12 years in the fund. He had taken out 600,000 euro in income. Um, so it might've been about 14 years, yeah. And he, his value was worth 1.425. So having taken out all of that income, for that period of years, he was still significantly ahead. Um, so in terms of him passing that on to the children, they're over 21, it'll be taxed at 30%, and it's a significant asset to, to hand on. But I mean, the, the risk is always there that if he had had difficult investment years or if, if the investment approach hadn't worked, his 1.2 could be at 700 now, you know? So you do need to, it's not all positive, you do need to be mindful of the fact that Clients really need to understand the risks and need to be comfortable with that level of risk, you know. And I generally gauge that by asking them, if your fund goes down by 10%, how upset will you be? And invariably they say, no, no, I'll, I'll be grand, that's fine. And then I'll ask them, well, if, if, if your fund goes down by 20% and then you get a good sense of, like, you know their level of risk then based on, I mean, 90% of people are the same. Everyone can tolerate a small bit of drop, but nobody wants a big drop. And you have to assess and, you know, set up the investment approach to reflect that reality then. Perfect. And then we just have one last question at the moment anyway. What is the tax treatment of the once off pension payment in example one? Does it create corporate tax loss in the year, assuming the pension contribution exceeds the profits to that point? Brian, that might be one for you there. Yeah, well, actually, it's actually one for the accountant. I'd normally yeah, refer that well, back. Actually, Morna, Morna can jump in. Yeah, Morna has offered to, to help us on that. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose the thing is there is there is legislation, and it's. I think it's if I'm right now, don't shoot me. I think it's section seven seven two of the Taxes Consolidation Act in around that area, and it basically says you have to look at spreading the employer um, ordinary contribution. So if they're in excess of the ordinary employer's That's contribution true. or subject max to 6,350, you actually have to do kind of a calculation whereby you take the amount that the, the once off payment and divide it by that denominator being the ordinary, the ordinary um, employer amount or the 6350 to get a number of years that you put it over the spread. So you can't take a deduction for the full amount in the year in which it's um, it, it's put in to the, to the pot, but you can spread it out. And there is a maximum of five years okay. um, so there, you can't, it won't create a tax loss in the year in which you make the lump sum payment into, into the pension. You must spread it. There's a, there's a spreadability kind of um, uh, position that needs to be achieved, but it is only based on the ordinary employer's pension contribution 
up or the max of 6350. So there is there is a time kind of delay with the corporation tax deduction. So it won't create a loss for you. But you can, Marna, use the ordinary contributions across the whole business. So yes. it covers. So if you have a pension scheme and all that. Yeah. So um, it depends on the number yeah. of employees or what's going on in the actual entity itself. So if it's a one single employee, you know, yeah. there might it, it, there there might be a little tax inefficiency. But if it, but look, if you're looking at the entity yeah. as a whole, then, you know, it is the it's the whole um, company. Yeah. Um, and it is possible also to, you know, if you do it with 12 months out, for instance, right. You can actually plan over a year and, you know, you can he could increase. So just say a guy paying in a million could decide to pay a regular premium of 300,000 over two years, plus a single premium of 300. And then it, it meets your requirement there for that, you know. Yeah, it's part of the pension planning process, I it's suppose, for the, the individual. Yeah, yeah. So you need to be, it's, pre, it's prepayment, I think, is it's kind of, um, it's prepayment set up so that you can look at the, the years before you decide to maybe make the top up uh, and it, you, can, you can achieve um, a more efficient basis for it. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That's all the questions we have for now. So, Brian, if you want to... I, I know we're pushed for time, so I, yeah. I literally just wanted to introduce, uh, f for the last two minutes, just to introduce again who LIA are. Um, obviously, we are the uh, Centre of Excellence for Education and Development of Finance Professionals, but we've been in existence for over 40 years, and our key programmes meet the minimum competence. And I just wanted to show, with regards to minimum con competence and qualifications, that's a list of uh, some of the qualifications available with LIA, but in particular that may be of interest to some of the members here is in relation to a, a, the minimum competence entry point and, and meeting with the standard requirements for advising clients on the five categories of retail financial products. The QFA designation is the uh, gold standard within the level seven, and that is what people aspire to have in relation to be able to engage with consumers on a financial planning point of view. And at the moment, we've over 22,000 QFAs across Ireland. Now, in contrast, uh, the, the population that Damien and myself are part of, the CFP professionals, um, the CFP professional designation is an internationally recognised qualification. And there are 192,000 CFPs in the, in the world but approximately just over 850 of those are in the Republic of Ireland and not all are practitioners. So it does help you stand out in regards to your, your uh, practice and your business model. Um, but there are a number of other qualifications. What I will do is I'll share this few slides with uh, you, Jennifer, afterwards, and you might distribute it across to everybody. What I would say in relation to our education programs is they are all online and they're all distance learning. Um, and they are flexible study options enabling students to work around family and other commitments. And I would be living proof of that. It, it is something that is beneficial to, to accommodate all your work life and other commitments that you have going on in the real world. But it still allows you to uh, advance your qualifications and your career um, opportunities or your business model. The postgraduate model with regards to being a CFP model, it can be achieved over an 18 month period. Um, Others take, on, take it on over a 36 month. It is, though, the gold standard from a beyond minimum competence uh, level. Um, other things that LA offer, we do offer seminars in relation to education and development events, which offer CPD. Um, these events are provided at a very low cost based on the number of CPD errors provided. And we also, for our members, offer give back events. And in particular, there are some very interesting ones from a a HR mindfulness and motivational point of view. And in June, I know I'm involved in one event that you know, I'm very interested in, which is at mid-year when people need to focus on you know, over achieving their potential. Uh, we have a very good speaker coming on in June called Neil O'Brien, who, who uh, has written a, a number of topics and his website is Time to Fly. But that's a free event for our members that get to participate in. We also run CPD events, but we also provide the CPT requirements that members need to meet with for minimum competence view, and that's all available online. We have um, over 50 plus CPD webinars available to our members to complete and any events that they complete or, or modules that they complete online immediately go off their CPD record with LIA. And if anybody wants to 
know more about LIA, I am the point of contact. Um, you'll see there my point of contact details. I have an email address, brian.dunphy at lia.ie. My mobile number is on, on screen. And just what I do is I offer the opportunity to have a chat in relation to what our qualifications, our membership, our designations can do for an individual. I have over 20 years experience in, in the financial services industry. Um, I was a financial planning consultant. I now work for LIA. Um, I was conduct oversight manager for a retail bank for approximately 10 years. And I also was a credit appeals manager, which was the independent person who would look at corporate and SME customers who had their credit declined or withdrawn. And I would look at it from an independent point of view to see was it a fair decision and challenge the institution on, on their uh, policies. And I also had some experience as a complaints manager in relation to financial advice. So all in all, I've had a number of roles within financial services. And I, I share that experience and, and knowledge along with the academic qualifications that can assist in, in financial planning and a model that you might incorporate into your business. So look, I'd ask, the only other thing I'd ask is if anyone wants to know more about LIA or, or anything that I've spoken about, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to arrange a time to have a call with anybody. So thanks a million again, Jennifer, for the opportunity for it to be to be part of the event tonight and to sponsor this. LIA are delighted to, um, you know, get get to speak to as many people as possible, and in particular the accountancy body. Um, we feel this great opportunity coming down the path with regards to retirement planning and, um, in particular financial planning as a whole. No, thank you. We're really delighted to have you. Um, thanks everybody for joining us this evening and as Brian said if there's any questions of that feel free even to pass them on to us and we can get them across to Brian or Damien. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much.